Good morning, everybody. Here we are with another lockdown, lockdown presentation, um, special one this morning. Um, normally, uh, that the we've been doing this week has been afternoons, um, but uh, this morning we've got a, another presentation from uh, Roger Machen from uh, Canon, and uh, today we are talking uh, color management, uh, Pixma Pro, etc. Um, yes. And uh, you know the, the cool thing about uh, you know printing at home or at at, at your studio is that you've got something tangible. You know, the, it's the one thing that, that I find that we've almost lost a little bit with uh, being digital, et cetera, is that you don't have something that's printed and on your wall and you can look at it and go, eh, that's crap, or eh, that's fantastic. Um, but it's, you know, there's something so missing that I think the, the, the printing, um, uh, you know, we need to speak about and, and, and uh, see how we can get a little bit more of that. But then even, even more than that is the, the color management. So from, from source, to the final product, making sure that the color is correct from the start to the finish, and you're not going through some conversion that may be changing something, etc. Um, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll let uh, Roger talk about all the technical yeah, stuff. I'll, I'll do all the technical yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity again. And as I say, um, the, the the reason why I'm doing this, the Canon sponsored uh, content, is, is to indicate you know that yes, we're investing in you as the group, as the presenter or the owner of this group, but specifically to drive you know more investment from from other brands. You know why why are the other brands not sort of jumping on as well and 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 paid you know, paid for sponsored content. Um, for me, as, as Canon, it's a, it's a logical extension. I mean, I've got a captive audience, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and you, you've got a, a, a fantastic database of, of people that I want to talk to. And as I say, I'll gladly pay for that privilege. Um, and as I say, if, if, if we're the, the foot in the door that gets the other brands to come and sponsor your channel, fan freaking fantastic. Um, yeah, okay. I really appreciate, <laughs> uh, really appreciate that because, you know, someone was asking me yesterday about... Um, you know, saying that it was great that it wasn't a brand specific thing. And that, that's the whole intention. You know, everyone is welcome. Yeah. Um, obviously, if it's, uh, you know, the, the sponsored presentations are fantastic because it, it, it helps us, you know, keep it going. Um, of course, yeah. So we really appreciate that. Oh, that's good news. Um, okay, jumping into to what I'm doing here. Um, I was asked a, a, a couple of years ago to do a presentation for uh, pro photographers at a, a, at a print show that Canon was, uh, had a massive stand at. We, we had a like, couple of thousand square meter stand uh, at a show called FESPA, which was um, one of the biggest Africa print and printing industry type, type showcases. And uh, at the time, we were just launching some of our big pro, like super wide format, professional quality photo printers and uh, as I say I was asked to put together a, a presentation on color management and uh, it's kind of interesting because I, I did a training course on, on color management in in the Netherlands about oh gosh no about 10 years ago and it was a three-day course <laughs> three days how do you condense three days of color management into a short presentation for photographers uh, and at the end of the day I kind of managed to do exactly that you can get it down to literally 15 20 minutes if you know the absolute basics um everything else becomes kind of secondary and it's, it's far more critical if you're going into sort of massive print kind of environments but for the average photographer they don't really need this uh, or need more than this um possibly because they're not printing uh but the, the motivation here is not necessarily to sell the printers, but to sell the idea of printing. And um, like you mentioned right at the beginning, it is uh, far more important than people actually realize. Um, there was a guy who was one of the founders of the internet a couple of years back, did a presentation on what he called the digital dark age. And it was quite a fascinating presentation because the mentality is that we're going to sooner or later get to a point where um, we're going to enter a dark age uh, of digitalness. And the, to a certain degree, we're already there. Uh, as an example, when um, you know, sort of computers and, and home offices start becoming a major thing, the majority of the software that was used for accounting, for example, uh, Lotus Notes or Lotus 123, those kind of software packages, those were what were used by the, an enormous amount of companies to record all of their, their transactions store all their uh, invoices and all of that kind of story and slowly but surely that company went bankrupt as Microsoft became the dominant brand and Excel became the number one thing that 99% of the world uses uh, everybody migrated to Excel and to a certain degree you know those Lotus notes you know, for the first couple of issues of Excel, you could actually still open those files. Then it became less critical. So Excel just sort of binned that. Now this situation is where this company's going, oh, let's have a look at the records from 10 years ago. 
It's like, ah, yeah, they're in Lotus Notes. We can't open them anymore. The software doesn't exist. The, um, you know, the, the support for that software doesn't exist. And la you know, the latest packages uh, don't support those old things. And you kind of think, oh, well, uh, yeah, yeah, I can understand for, for accounting software. But look at things like Corel Draw. Now, Corel Draw was, was absolutely massive. At one stage, they were bigger than Adobe and, and bigger than Photoshop. Corel Draw was the package. And if you wanted to save in a CRD or whatever the format was, Corel Draw format or CDR, I can't even remember what it was. You saved your, you know, your, your, your image with all the layers and all the different changes in that specific format. That company went, went through a whole bunch of changes. I don't even know if they're still around. But what are the possibilities of being able to open those files now? Well, um, they, 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 we do have, in some instances, especially on the, on the Black Rooster side, where um, people want to send uh, Black, uh, Corel Draw files, and we just go, yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, because yeah. the are printers that still use them, um, but it's, it's very few and far between. Yeah, yeah. And it, it gets to the point that, that sooner or later, you know, everything changes. Um, you know, we, we're already in a situation now where digital photo professional Canon software supports the CR3 and the CRW files. But older CR2 files from uh, raw files from cameras that are like sort of 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, um, you can't open anymore unless you've got DPP version 3. So we've still got some versions of that software. But we're going to get to a point where we're actually going to say, hang on a second. And I've got images. I mean, I, I've been shooting raw files since the year 2000 when the D30 came out. And that was a CR2 file. Uh, it probably actually even CR1, even me. God, I don't even think. <laughs> Scary to think. But um, what happens if JPEG is no longer the standard format? Uh, JPEG becomes, oh, yeah, nobody shoots JPEG, everybody. Everybody shoots now HEIF, H-E-I-F. Now, we've already got two cameras on our lineup that shoot HEIF, uh, and that's the new wide dynamic range uh, file format with JPEG kind of sizes, but with uh, a much wider HDR type of look and feel. Well, they I'm, already I'm exist. I'm just thinking of all the, all the raw files um, that I'm keeping because I might want to edit them later. Um, yeah. You know, hundreds of, of, of dual layer DVDs that are sitting in, 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 in a, a storage offsite, B storage somewhere else, on external yeah. drives. And I, I didn't even think about the fact that possibly down the line, those raw files won't even be able to be opened in. Uh, have, you, have you looked at the side of your laptop to find the DVD player? Because, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, no, I've, that's I, I possibly external, even a bigger issue. <laughs> I do have an external um, reader because of that very issue, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and when last you plug it in, switch it on, is it still working? Everything groovy? Um, the, yeah. These are the things that we, we have a tendency to forget. You know, um, I, I, I started backing up a lot of images to, to DVD discs, oh, good, eight, nine, ten years ago. And that's great and all, but when I look now, I'm going, oh, hang on, how do I even open them? My, my laptop is way for thin. My Mac is way for thin. And neither of them have got a, a, a DVD tray anymore. I'm, Okay, hang on a second. And the, the, this, again, is, is the, the mentality. And as I say, the, this guy presented on the digital dark age. And the only thing that has permanence is, is print. Uh, and for photographers, you know, we're not saying print everything. I mean, that, 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 that era of, you know, when you, when you shot a roll of 36, you went to the lab, you printed 36. And you binned all the boo-boo bin or whatever it was. You chucked the ones that you didn't like. And you kept the ones you wanted to keep. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we've all got a box somewhere in the house with, with some photographs from, of us as, okay, yep. depending on how old you are, <laughs> I'm talking to some of my age group, uh, there's a box somewhere in the house that we've inherited from our mums or our grandparents full of photographs in envelopes. And, um, you know, I've got a box for, from, from all of the film, film that I shot while I was at, at college, which was, you know, a, a roll of film a, a, a day in some cases for, for, you know, five, six, seven years. It was, there's a ton of stuff. And I haven't looked at that for years, but again, those photographs are still in envelopes and I still can access them yeah. a lot quicker and a lot easier than, oh, hang on, where did I put that external drive of those images that we shot? Because my four terabyte got full and then I bought an eight terabyte and I put some of the four terabyte, but then I, I filled up that four terabyte. And then there's like another, uh, oh, hang on. Somewhere around here is another drive. Uh, yeah, you, you keep finding these things. Oh, oh, there's another drive. You plug it in. Oh, that's the Star Trek drive. That's got Star <laughs> Trek on it. That's cool. You know, I, I, you keep sort of figuring out, like, hang on a second. Um, yeah, we've got an inordinate amount of images uh, as photographers. Um, 
And are, are they being seen? Uh, how many of us have got folders full of raw files with some amazing shots? Um, never been that, edited. Never been edited. Yeah. And, and a practical example was, was when I, I did the, the little presentation, one of your first ones, uh, starting off the group. And I, I said, oh, I'll just do some pictures of, 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 of you know, what, what I shoot. And then to go through those old folders, like, oh, crap, oh, I've done air shows. Oh, I must find something with a propeller. And, like, <laughs> and it took absolutely ages to try and find something and then edit something that looked really good really quickly. Um, and, and as I know from one of those bird shots, I've got lots better than that. But when you go to Maryvale every week, three weeks, or, you know, three weeks of every month for a year and a half, uh, we did that, didn't we? Something like That's that. That's a lot of images. There's a stupendous amount of images, and, and even worse when you've got a youngster like mine who's got who's trigger happy. Uh, and I must admit, I was quite hysterical about that uh, Australian lady you had on the other day. She was uh, great, I, 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 I take five thousand images. I'm like, you, you do what? You know, like, That's how, less than how do you scroll? How do you scroll scroll through five thousand images and find the absolute winner? Yeah. Mm. So the the thinking behind this is um, we need to print we need to print more because there's a longevity to it and there's a sharing to it, um, and it's not just about the the old, older generation. It's it's about everybody about everything, and, and it's about preserving memories and and it's um, it becomes quite a. It became quite a personal thing for me. Uh, I, I lost my wife a couple of years ago to to cancer, and one of the things that, that I had to do after she after she died was was go through her computer and go through her hard drive, and I found folders and folders and folders of images. She didn't store anything logically, you know. As photographers, we have May shoot for Bob and Frank, and then everything's you know edited, unedited, raw. We keep everything logically. Uh, please tell me you do that. If you don't, yes, yes, you better yes. start. You know, now's the time to do it. You know, um, and, and as I say having to go through whole folders and folders of her images what was amazing was that um there were so many pictures of me uh, which which i didn't have you know my my my, my laptops are, and my hard drives are full of pictures that i've taken and i'm not in any of them but her her computer was full of images of me and i had it was tons of them that i hadn't even seen and, and it was like you know simultaneously heartbreaking simultaneously amazing but it was one of those things that um you know life is fragile life is short um it, it's it, it, without being sort of you know sort of grim and horrible you know what happens if you die tomorrow um does somebody know how to access your computer does somebody know how to get to your images what images are important what what images are you know just you, you just shot thousands and thousands of is somebody going to come and have a look at your hard drives and go through oh wow there's forty eight thousand images here which ones are worth keeping? Mm -hmm. um, now's the time to do these things. Uh, and I'm gonna swing my camera around very quickly, sorry about the laptop thing, just to give you an idea uh, of the kind of picture wall that I have behind me. Um, we, we, we have these things uh, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, we print photographs all the time. We update them um, all the time. There's plenty of images. There's all sorts of places around here. I'm gonna swing back around, sorry. Uh, just to give you an example that, um, Printed images are important for us to to preserve memories. You know, our picture wall has got our current family, and it has photos with my family, with my my first wife. It has photographs with my second wife and her first husband, because that's our family. And again, you know, as you can see, the little family where yeah. you know, it's not there for a reason other than to remind us that this is probably one of the most important things. So, um, again, let's get let's get to the interesting stuff. Um, I, I'm going to start sharing screen now, so we can start talking about color management uh, and and the importance of, of printing. So theoretically, if I do that, and while you're doing that, that uh, Hamish uh, Niven wants to know. So when are my Canon? Or when are Canon not going to manage my CR2 files? My 5D4 is still pretty new. Oh, no, the, 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 the 5D4 CR2 files don't worry too much about. It. It's the CR2 files from the um, the generation that precedes the sort of 20D, 30D. So it's the D30, D60, uh, 10D. But also the um, the 1D Mark One, 1, 1D Mark Two, 1D Mark Two N, that sort of time period between sort of 2000 and 2004, 2005. You can still download DPP version three, but those those files are not viewable in DPP version four at all. So that that's already an issue. That you know you have to have a slightly older version of that software. Um, having said that, you know what what do you save it in that safer? You know is TIFF DNG, whatever it is, I don't know. I can't give you the answer. But um, 
as things do change, as I say, the fact that JPEG is already uh, being questioned at the moment because HAIF is the standard format used by um, Apple phones and uh, more and more cameras are now going to come out with HAIF as a format. It's incredibly efficient. Um, it's, an, it's a very, very small file that, that holds an enormous amount of data. Um, and as I say, the DX3 is one of the practical examples that I can shoot raw and HAIF files simultaneously. Um, what happens when JPEG becomes something that's, oh gosh, yeah, I remember when we used to shoot JPEG? That's going to be scary. Gonna, that's going to be, if, if that ever happens, that's going to be ridiculously yeah. scary if you can't access those uh, images. I, I get that. And, you know, we're not talking two years. We're talking 20 years. We're talking 30 years. This is not necessarily about you and your hard drive and your images. It's about your children and your grandchildren you know, having a look at your legacy. And, um, you know, printers and, and printing images is, is far more important than actually people give credence to. And as pro photographers, we, we, we have a responsibility to, to not only sh make sure our work is seen um, by ourselves, but, but also seen by others. And it's, um, you know, fa Facebook crunches the resolution down to a horrible degree. Majority of online sharing things, you know, Instagram. Uh, am I getting a really good impression of how awesome your photograph is from a picture that's on there? Not at all. So, so yeah, I, I, I urge people to, to consider it quite, quite deeply. So, um, okay, off to the presentation. It's back to work. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to do is, is cover the absolute, absolute basics of color management. And it is a little text heavy, but I'll try to put as many pictures in to try and elaborate um, the simplicity of it. it. It is one of those things most photographers are petrified about and um, they shouldn't worry too much because in the greater scheme of things, it's critical if you're printing, number one. Uh, it's partially critical if you are um, showing on web, but uh, how many photographers shoot uh, and then edit on their computer and then send it out onto the World Wide Web and hoping against all hopes that their monitor is calibrated. If your monitor is not calibrated, the colors you see your camera is seeing, the colors that you're editing, and then you send it to the World Wide Web, the colors that the entire world is seeing could be completely and utterly totally different to what you have in mind. You're seeing it like this, you're editing it so it looks like that, and they're viewing this. Your viewer's perspective, perspective of what your image is uh, could be totally skewed. There's so, one, there's one right. more layer to that, uh, Roger, and that is yeah. that... Um, Chrome and Firefox display color very differently. Chrome is much more accurate. Uh, Firefox yes. is more saturated, uh, et cetera. So even in that uh, uh, respect, you know, when it comes to designing your, your website, making sure yep. that the, the, the web developer has, has put in that adjustment so that on Firefox, it doesn't have it so saturated. That's also something that's another layer of complexity. Yeah, and then added to that, things like the standard computer PC environment, uh, color management is per application versus Apple Mac color management is within the operating system and applies across every application. So, you know, you don't need color management in GarageBand, but Movie Maker Pro and you know, Lightroom or, you know, you know, whatever it is, all those kind of things, you want to have color management across it. But if your PC is now showing you XYZ colors in Lightroom and ABC colors in PowerPoint. Um, no, that could be quite different. All right, let's just see why this is not working. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I grabbed a couple of really cool quotes uh, about color um, because it, it's one of those things that's sort of underestimated. You know, as, as photographers, we shoot color all the time. And, you know, we do black and white as, a, um, as an aside or as an experiment or as a play. But we, we don't really sort of understand. And you look at the, some of the names, Cezanne, Matisse, Gauguin, you know, from the Impressionist French uh, you know, painters sort of eras. Um, that was when, when color became really, really a major, major, major thing when they started playing with color rather than sort of sticking to the standard um, you know, reality type of things where skin tones had to be absolutely perfect. Uh, when the Impressionists started going out, the whole word Impressionist was about their getting their impression of the world. There was no hyper-reality um, 
that that had existed in, in art before that and, and i would i would challenge the vast majority of uh, of serious photographers to have a look and do a, a study of uh, of art um I, I was very very lucky that as, as a teenager i inherited a book from my grandmother which is called the history of art and it was like this massive a1 a2 book that opened up to a1 oh no hang on a3 that opened up to a2 it was that kind of size was that the hill and garden Oh, God, I can't even remember, but it was it was amazing, and I don't even know where it is now. That that's that's how sacrilegious it is. But I spent an inordinate amount of time looking at at, at paintings and and um, looking at the history of art and seeing how things changed, uh, and it, it gives you an idea of how um, as a photographer color becomes something that can be very 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 subjective so my opinion of oh like those colors are lovely and warm and you're going you know um everybody's opinion is totally and utterly different and you'll see people like Cezanne Matisse Gauguin uh, Campbell White Kandinsky all saying something different but it is a power which directly influences the soul there's a reason we don't see the world in black and white the language of dreams it's the artist's brain the rainbow of chaos colors are critical and majority of brands and marketing companies have cottoned onto the idea that color is important to indicate uh, through your logo a certain idea so red means passion active you know exciting bold youthful pink purple navy green all of these things mean different things to marketing and this is based on years and years and years of research it's not necessarily always true but if you start thinking about it kind of carefully, you'll see how important certain colors are to certain logos and certain emotions that are, that are triggered by, by colors. So optimism, clarity, and warmth comes from those yellow, yellow and black logos. I'm not too sure about that first one. Anyway, um, friendly, cheerful, confidence, uh, you know, Fanta. I don't see Fanta as friendly, but hey, I, I'm confident in a Harley Davidson. I'm kind of okay with that. Excitement. Oh, yeah, look, there's between Kellogg's and Coke, Cola, and oh, hey, there's Canon. Um, apparently, we're about excitement, youthful, and boldness. Um, I wondered how, how much. Uh, investment was put into that when you start looking at the, that Canon logo. Um, it dates from the sort of, uh, well, the, the red on white dates from the sort of late 1940s, early 1950s. That was when we chose that particular color. Um, and the Pantone has changed a little bit, but that Pantone is locked in stone. It's Pantone 186C. That is Canon's red. That is full stop. That is our red. It's totally, totally different to everybody else's red. But imagine that Canon logo in blue on a white background. Imagine it in black on a yellow background, you know, God forbid. But any of those logos, if you take, for example, Avis, if you saw Avis in, in green on a yellow background, it, there's something wrong there. It doesn't work. It doesn't correlate. And the, one of the strangest things I ever saw was the McDonald's logo, that lovely yellow golden arches, which 99% of the time is up against a red background. And, um, you know, we know that, you know, the, the, the McDonald's golden arches are on a red background. That's what it is. In every single town, in every single city, in all over the entire world, except for one city, one city on the entire planet does not have the McDonald's logo against a red background. And it's a city called Kyoto in Japan, which was built on the, on the most uh, intense feng shui type of uh, design where there's a main road that does this, there's the mountains, the waterfall, the dragon, the whole pathway, the river, everything about that city was designed uh, around feng shui. And the color red uh, in that entire city um, is seen as quite evil and quite sinister and to be avoided at all costs and in Kyoto the McDonald's logo is against a dark brown background and the only city in the entire world where they've actually deviated from their red that's a pretty interesting story if you ever get the chance to go to Kyoto just look out for the McDonald's and go ah it's, it's, it's an interesting little aside but it goes to show how critically important you know brand colors and, and brands actually invest in their colors and almost every single ad campaign that we put together the most critical things we're looking at are the logos the branding etc 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 we we have a, a bible which is about uh 800 pages long this massive file uh, about what you can and what you cannot do with the canon logo down on the bottom left hand side of the picture and um, those rules are 
cut and die. They're, they're, you do not, you know, if we, we talk to a new ad agency, if we talk to new photographers, um, that's the first rule is we, you know, go and read the guidebook uh, before we start playing with the logo because uh, there are, the, the, the rules are very, 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 very strict. And it's not just us. Every single one of those logos, every single one of those brands that you see on the screen have in, instituted the same level of importance to their to their logos now you'll see there's other brands in the top 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 right hand corner nbc google etc ebay that are trying to capitalize on everything that's a rainbow look of things that we symbolize absolutely everything and the only one i would personally think actually does symbolize that more than anything else would, would be google um, purely because they are all things to all people and um, very, very clever of them to, to stick to that. When you take that logo away, if you ask people to say uh, which colors are which, which letters are which color, nobody can ever get a, get a right or remember it, but moving swiftly along. <laughs> All right, so color management's based on the perception of the average person. In 1931, the International Commission about Illumination set up a model of color perception. And this is based on experiments with a large group of people and became what was the basis for lab or lab color, which is still used, used today. And it's the basis for all color profiles. And essentially what it represents is on a two-dimensional scale, the maximum level of colors and what wavelengths of light that the human eye can perceive. So at the top of that curve, the green is green, the bottom left, the blue is blue, the furthest right, the red is red. That's what the human eye can perceive. That is, those are the colors and those are the gradations and the steps that people can actually essentially see. And it's quite interesting that there's a purple boundary. I'm not going to go into depth about that. <clears throat> but there is an absolute, absolute point where the human eye cannot see into the ultraviolet. And it is a straight line. Almost everything else is, is, is a gentle curve. Uh, but that is pretty damn strange, that purple line. But what's interesting to see is not so much about that big bell curve is the triangles within it. Majority of our cameras shoot in Adobe RGB. That's that big purple triangle. Uh, the majority of uh, websites, majority of projectors, majority of um, you know, computer screens work in sRGB. Look at how small that yellow triangle is. And then the majority of printers work in that, I think it's a pentagon, hectagon, hexagon, I don't know, that seven-sided, not even quite really a triangle, um, that's what an overwhelming majority of printers print in. So obviously there's some sort of correlation between the green that you see that might be outside of that triangle, the green that you're seeing uh, in that purple triangle from the camera, the green that you're seeing in the yellow triangle from your computer monitor, and the green that you're seeing in that purple figure that's coming out of your printer. There could be four different types of green. And that's one of the things that becomes kind of hard. Everything needs to be plotted against what we call lab color. So color management is how do we talk between these, these, these three, four, five different zones. So although it seems quite a small difference, the impact can be huge. RGB is tr seen as a visual thing and is traditionally a lot more vibrant when you're looking at on a camera or a screen or a projector. CMYK that comes out of a printer uh, by default is a lot more desaturated. It's a lot more flat, a little bit more um, pastel almost in a, in a way. It's difficult to show it on a, on a computer screen. And, and, as, and again, primary example is here, what I'm seeing on my computer screen, which is calibrated, this is what you're seeing on yours, Quinton, what any of the other three viewers are seeing. I don't know how many viewers we've got. <laughs> I'm hoping it's more than three. Uh, everybody's seeing a different type of perspective. But hopefully you will be able to see there is some sort of color difference between that RGB circle and that CMYK circle. It's been done specifically to give you that hint. The impact can be huge, even though it seems kind of small. So cameras and monitors capture in RGB. All printers use cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And the RGB is the additive color model. The CMYK is the subtractive model. And I'm going to go into depth about this. You might have done this at science at school. And if you did study photography, this is one of the most important things. By adding red, green, and blue together in light, you get white light. This only applies with light. When you're talking about ink, CMYK is a subtractive color, and you add one color to another, and black is the result. Theoretically, it's never 100% true black, which is why we add the K, the black ink, um, to strengthen the other colors and to create a true black. Because subtractive, the cyan, yellow, magenta, 
don't always add up to a true black. And as you can see, there's overlaps between red and green light. If I had to say to you, mix red and green light, what color you're going to get, um, the last answer you would come up with would be yellow. It's kind of bizarre. Red and blue, kind of logical, would kick out a magenta. Blue and green kicking out a cyan, it seems kind of weird. And the other way around works for printing. So you add yellow and blue, sorry, yellow and cyan ink to create green. You add cyan and magenta to create blue. You add cyan, uh, sorry, magenta and yellow to create red. And again, this goes back to high school light, the sciences of light, the different wavelengths of light, um, how the computer screen and how the camera work in the RGB space versus how the printers work in the CMYK space. Um, are there any questions? I have to just stop there very, very quickly because Not this is moment. normally the the, the, the the glitching point when I start training where there's a hand that comes up and goes, I, I don't understand. If I'm make, mixing uh, blue and yellow paint, I get green. So, you know, that's paint. Paint, paint is another totally different animal <laughs> completely. Um, it is technically subtractive, but the pigments in paints work differently to the pigments in, in ink. And this is how we, we have to work in the digital domain. So we're not, you know, technically printers are painting on paper, but it's painting on paper with information from the digital device. Right, so color profiles uh, determine the colors in the image. So if you've got an image uh, without a profile, the uh, best example is a wine bottle without a label. Holding a green bottle, there's something sloshing inside there. Um, it could be Chardonnay, it could be you know rosé, it could be anything. Uh, you know, obviously white wine looks pretty much the same. But um, the image at the top has a profile, the bottom image has lost its profile. So color in information has been interpreted incorrectly and the image appears oversaturated. Now, Yes, this is an exaggerated example, but if I have that top image and it's tagged with an Adobe RGB color space, I then open it in Photoshop. Photoshop immediately knows what Adobe RGB is and displays it correctly. If it receives an image without a profile, it doesn't know, and it applies its own science. And what Adobe does to that, what Apple does in Final Cut, what uh, DaVinci does in Resolve, and what um, Capture One uh, does um, could be completely and utterly totally different. So understand I've got a, I've got a question there, if, you, if you're on. able to. So, so Hamish yeah. says, um, does a click from Photoshop make CMYK, uh, CMYK from RGB correctly or what is correctly? Ooh, Hamish, well done. You're four slides ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna get there because the the next the next part is okay. The first things first is is about what you see, and then the next thing is about what you process, and the next part is what what you get. So, we're, thanks Hamish, good question. But you're you're like everybody in the room. There's, there's there's always one little star who has to put his hand up, and I'm four slides ahead of you. Hamish is that guy today. Well done, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we call the profile connection space. This is how the three things come together. So the, the, the image that you've got plus the profile that's coming from the camera, viewing it on the laptop, which is the image plus the laptop screen profile, and then the output, which is the image plus the printer color pro profile. And they all meet together in what we call the connection space. This is something that you have to really understand that if you want all three of these things to match, the most critical part is that connection space in terms of matching input to view to output. And how do we do this? So quite simply, these are the most critical things. And if there's any screen you want to print screen or, or capture, now's the one to do it. Set the color settings in your camera. This makes sure that your images are tagged with a profile. Set up your computer to ensure the profiles are read by the software, ensuring correct color. Calibrate and profile your monitor. This makes sure that you have a precise view of the image and then ensure you have the correct color settings for printing. So if we look here, for example, um, down the bottom right-hand side, this is a standard sort of window you would get from, from Mac. So in a working space, if it receives an image in RGB, it works as a Adobe RGB. It will convert that image from whatever thing it is into Adobe RGB. If it receives an image in CMYK, it will convert it to swap coated. Now, I'm not going to even go into depth about gray and spot because you don't really need to know them critically unless you're going into massive printing environments. If you're going into printing books and things like that, it may well be something you need. But for now, for the average photographer, you don't need it. Just leave it as the default. 
And then you have this thing called color management pro, pro, policies. What happens while, when Adobe gets an image? Preserve the embedded profile, convert to the color space, to, to, the, to the working color space, or discard. There's a whole bunch of different things. If you've got mismatches, always ask, always ask when pasting, always ask when opening. Now, these, these are the things I would say to you, by default, these preferences within Adobe will be set for you. Um, having said that, you do need to make that decision. So if you've got a camera that's shooting in sRGB and your workspace is Adobe RGB, when you open that image in Adobe, do you want Adobe to ask you every time it opens? Do you want Adobe to keep the embedded sRGB or do you want Adobe to convert? And based on these factors, um, because Adobe RGB color space is normally the biggest one, I would have to recommend the vast majority of photographers shoot in Adobe RGB. Because when you're converting from that to, you know, to, to the workspace, so if you've shot in sRGB and your computer is now currently, your Photoshop is set up for Adobe RGB, it won't show you sRGB. It will ask you, do you want to convert? Or if you've sort of not clicked these little tick boxes that say ask when opening, it could very well be converting for you automatically. So it's something you have to really, really, really make sure if you're serious about this, what is actually happening um, in Adobe? And if you've always ever used Adobe or Lightroom using the standard sort of preferences as it comes out of the box, um, what decisions have been made on your behalf? What I will say to you, um, if it's Adobe software, converting from sRGB to Adobe RGB is actually very, 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 very good. If it's third-party software, they could be doing something completely different. and We don't know about that. Um, so it, it is interesting times um, as far as this is concerned. And you need to choose uh, from your side exactly what is standard. Now, the CMYK color space, which is uh, when, you, when you're going out uh, to the printer, um, one of the options there is use the printer profile. And if all, if all else fails, using the printer profile is the most critical. And I'm gonna to go to that next. First and foremost, setting the color space on your camera. The overwhelming majority of photographers take the camera straight out of the box, they see color space sRGB, and they kind of leave it there. Um, the standard, as you can take it out of the box, is sRGB. I change every single camera. It's one of the first things I change immediately is to Adobe RGB. My laptop is, uh, my Photoshop, my Lightroom, my DPP is all set up on an Adobe RGB color space and I shoot in Adobe RGB. I'd rather have that big triangle of gamut and not need it than have a small triangle and then maybe have a printer that can print outside that triangle. So, sRGB, according to this wonderful picture that I grabbed from Google Image, uh, best for creating web, web content, web surfing, uh, color grading for video, and for general photography. Now, I agree with that to a certain degree because sRGB is what the overwhelming majority of your viewers are going to see the image in, but also a lot of the projectors at camera clubs, projectors at, at shows, etc., are set up for sRGB. And what you then see is what you're going to get. The color space is also substantially smaller and almost exactly the same size as CMYK. And what I would say to you, if you're printing at a venue in sort of small postcard size, if you're doing a photo booth or if you're doing a, um, you know, one camera that you're shooting the wedding for, but another camera for people to shoot and then plug into a little portable printer, for example, sRGB on, the, on that camera printing to postcard size uh, means you don't have to do any color grading or any, any kind of tweaking. The Adobe RGB, best for high-end printing work, best for top-end photography, pro design, uh, and pro web content. And I would have to say to you, uh, it, it's the age-old story, you know, it, it, shoot, shooting RAW or JPEG, uh, I would always say, you know, if, if, you don't, if, you, if you've got the bigger file size, you've got the space capacity, by all means, do it. The brilliant thing is when you shoot RAW on the cameras, uh, Canon cameras, Nikon, whatever the case may be, this color space is not embedded. So you can actually change it afterwards. So if you open the RAW file, you can say, change now from sRGB to Adobe RGB or vice versa. Chances are you're not gonna see a huge difference on your monitor. Uh, having said that, um, the Adobe RGB space, when you go to print, 
especially with the later printers. And we're going to talk about that in a minute as to what those later printers can actually offer you. So the final part, and this is you know, color management in its final, final nutshell, um, is the rendering intent. So I've taken the image in Adobe RGB. I've managed it within my Adobe RGB printing space, uh, sorry, monitoring space on my computer. How do I now send it to the printer in CMYK when I know the space the printer can print in is so much smaller than what the camera is shooting? And this is what we call color handling. And this is where you will select what we call a rendering intent. How does the printer render the colors that are outside of its gamut, outside of its printing area? So the, the most common two, and I, I'm going to go, into, I'm going to, only going to talk about these two because there are normally about four or five, but these are the two that 99% of the photographers uh, that I know of work with. Relative color metric will take anything outside of the printer's gamut. So the printer can only print to that point there. Anything above it, it will crush them all down to that maximum point. Boom. Perceptual will take everything outside and gradually Put it, put it in at various levels. This is often sometimes when you've seen, seen somebody who's printed something with blue sky and you've got that white at the horizon going light blue, dark, 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 all the way through to the top. Sometimes you'll see a printer, you can almost see faint lines that have pretty much been stepped. Um, the relative color metric has a tendency to do that. Perceptual will give you very, very, very smooth gradations. And from a photographic point of view, I would almost by default go to perceptual nine times out of ten the the odds where i've ever used relative color metric is pretty much slim indeed and perceptual for my mind for photographers because of the gradations that we're working in smooth skin tones those highlights going through to shadow areas perceptual by all means is the absolute best now you'll see here color handling printer manages colors <laughs> or I, I i handle colors or i let the software handle colors I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this from the get-go. Please let the printer manage the colors. <laughs> All the manufacturers who make the printers have set, have, have done their color profiles to maximize the quality out of their ink and their paper. If you've selected genuine inks, if you've selected genuine paper from HP, Lexmark, Epson, Canon, whoever, the profiles that they've built in, they're managing the, the colors themselves, is the simple and the best way to do it. If you, however, have spent 15 to 20,000 Rand buying a printer calibration tool and you spent an enormous amount of money of ink and paper calibrating your printer to the absolute, absolute nth degree, and you can do this. We, we, we have a color management center uh, within Canon's offices in Centurion. I'll gladly show you it uh, again, if you pop past the showroom sometime. Um, not everybody, not all at once, phone it, be hit, phone it hit. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. Um, but a lot of our major, major, major production machines are calibrated to a, a finer degree. But you'll actually find the level of adjustment on a calibrated printer is so minor by comparison to um, the profiles that are built into the printers. So rather let the printer manage the color. Printer profile. Again, let the printer, uh, you know, if you want to go to Adobe RGB, you can do that. But again, the default setting will be the printer's own profile, so leave it there. The only thing you really want to change here is relative color metric. When you go to printer preferences, obviously, you will then change size of paper, width of the border, uh, type of paper, and, uh, and all of those other kind of settings, etc. which when you come back here, might well have changed some of these settings. But the default here is the only one you really want to change is rendering intent. And that's essentially it. When it goes, when you go to print, that, the, the, that's what you need to know about color management. Um, essential tools. Um, and the, the, this is where it becomes the, the workspace you're working in. Um, a good workspace with neutral colors. If I'm sitting in a, in a workroom, I'm not quite agreeing with this one over here, particularly because the light shining straight at the eye. I don't know how that works, but I, I, I grabbed, uh, again, Google image search, best workspaces for photographers. And this came, this came up and I was like, okay, I'm not 100% sure about that. This one here with a uniform gray type of look and feel is fantastic. Uncluttered is fantastic. If you've got strange lighting in your room, like fluorescent coming from the side, daylight from you know, the other side and tungsten above you, by all means, please. For video editing and color grading, this kind of shade over a monitor is 
way, 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 way critical. But all I can say to you is the more neutral the workspace you're in, the better your color perception is going to be. And when I say neutral, I mean neutral to all intents and purposes. I wouldn't even have this red thing in the corner here. I wouldn't even have that orange drive. Uh, in the greater scheme of things, the more neutral you've got, the more subtle the gray that you have, the better your color impression is going to be. If I've got a wacky great red plant port here and this wall is painted green, I'm not going to get the right perspective on, on what I'm seeing. The other thing that, um, that I found, Roger, is that I've, I put um, the, the sort of down lighters in, in my roof, I put as uh, daylight balanced. Um, yep. And I also, when I'm, when I'm editing something that's color critical, um, I close the, the blinds so that, so that the, the, the space that I, or, or the, uh, the, the, the ambient brightness that I have in the, in the studio is yeah. the same as it was the last time I edited something like that. So you can compare sure. apples with apples. Because otherwise, you know, if it's a bright day, uh, your, your eyes are sort of, you know, you're squinting a little bit and, and it seems like it's, it's too dark and you open it up and then you edit it that night and it's sure. completely the other way around. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to tell you, I, I was very fortunate a couple of years back to, to go visit the, um, the color management center at Canon head office in Tokyo. And I was utterly blown away. I wish I'd been able to take photographs in there because it was kind of radical. They had a, a, a standard photo studio set up with a standard one of those kind of charts, you know, the fluffy teddy, the color chart, bottle of wine, paper clips, you know, anything, something shiny, something fluffy, something green, something blue, um, the standard sort of photo shoot sort of environment. And racked up on a, on a photographic bar, on a sort of tripod bar pointing at that was uh, five different cameras from five different brands. On the opposite side was five different printers, you know, Canon, Sony, well, not Sony, sorry, Canon, HP, Lexmark, etc. And they were shooting from one uh, to the other to see how the color worked. And um, the entire room, floors, ceiling, walls, everything was painted 18% gray. Um, that's standard sort of Kodak gray. And they would basically go to a, a panel on the wall and they could dial in a color temperature to um, the, the one. So, you know, we work on Kelvin, uh, 3400 is tungsten. They could do 3462 if they wanted to. It was that kind of degree of accuracy. And they would punch the number into the, into the computer and it would actually change the color of the, the LED lights in the entire room. Brilliant stuff. Okay, we need to move forward a little bit quickly. Um, a good investment for pros, um, a color management tool. Um, if you've got a laptop, you really should be uh, calibrating your monitor at least on a, on a yearly basis, if not more often. CRT monitors, maybe not so much, but very, very few of us even use those anymore. LCD or LED displays uh, do need calibration at least once a year. These tools aren't cheap. The more professional they are, the more expensive they are. Uh, the more basic they are, the more iffy they can be. You can, however, uh, get companies to come out and do color calibration for you and calibrate your monitor. Once your monitor is calibrated, you will use that profile when you go to edit photos. And it will, you'll see colors changing between playing games on your computer or surfing the web to when you open Adobe. If you've got Adobe set up and say using this, this monitor profile, it will change the, the, the colors ever so subtly. And you know then that what you see is what you're going to get because you've calibrated your monitor. The red that it will show in the software and the red that that little device reads will then modify the software so it actually shows that red correctly. And you can then, and only then, make an accurate judgment on color. Uh, when last you calibrate your monitor, Quinton? I think it was about four weeks ago. I, oh, I do well it, done. Good I do answer. it on a monthly basis. Okay, and, and you've got one of these devices? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the, um, the, 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 the i1 uh, system. Yeah. yeah, I've got an i1 as well. It's a bit dated, but it still works. Alrighty, um, the other last thing that you can get as a photographer, uh, even if you, you don't calibrate your monitor, um, if, you, if, you, if you can't invest in one of those tools, a gray card is an incredibly good investment. You can get them on key rings, on little wrist straps nowadays, but the color checker cards, they're not cheap. Make no mistake, they are quite expensive. Uh, we bought one for our color studio, and I think it was about 2,000 Rand um, in a little book like that. The smaller ones are substantially cheaper, but if you're in an environment where you've got control of lighting and you're doing an entire shoot um, under the same lighting, take your first shot with that color checker, and you know for a fact that when you do your white balance or your little eyedropper check on that very, very first frame, you can copy and paste that color across the entire shoot and you will know 100% sure as long as the lights haven't changed, 
um, that your color is now 100% correct. And you'll see there's a grayscale there, but every single one of these colors, the red, the blue, the green, etc., is there for a specific reason. It represents an exact color. So that red is 25501 or whatever it is. I'm not even sure what those numbers are, but if you can't afford to calibrate your monitor, this is a very, very good investment as well. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the printers. Um, I'm going to go very, very quickly. I've only got 15 minutes left, but we're going to cover these these things in a little bit of detail. Um, the Pixma Pro line of printers comes from a very, very strong heritage. That red line was taken out of those Pro lenses and put into the Pro printers. So we've got a couple of models on the lineup. I'm not going to talk about the, the three biggies at the moment, the two, four, and six. I'm only going to talk about um, the three babies, the 10, the 100, and the 1,000, um, for a specific reason, because these are the ones that are specifically aimed at, at photographers. Um, pro photographers who've got a big... Uh, stock library, you've got a big organization, might well go to invest in those type of things. But the overwhelming majority of us would look at either an A3 Plus or an A2 machine. So the ba basic differences between them, the uh, the Pro 100 is our baby with a, uh, with dye inks. It has got eight ink tanks. The Pro 10 has got 10 ink tanks and uses pigment ink. And the Pro 1000 is now a 12 ink tank A2 machine. Um, all of them pretty much the same sort of resolution. I'm not going to go into too much depth about all these little bullet points because I'm going to go into information about each printer individually. So the two baby ones, it, ideal for today's photographers. A3 Plus is a convenient enough size that if you put it into an A2 frame, for example, it does look significantly big enough to become uh, something you want to showcase your work and sell. Uh, and could most certainly be used in, in galleries. Overwhelmingly, as, as, as photographers, we have a thing, tendency to think, well, if I'm going to go to a gallery, I need to print A0, A1, etc. Yes, that gives you a really, really big impression. It really does work well. But the overwhelming majority of photographs that are sold are substantially smaller. And an A3 or an A3 plus print in an A2 frame um, is seriously, seriously uh, impactful and is well worth uh, considering. So the baby, the Pro 100S, uh, what we would call an entry-level Pro printer, uh, a dye-based ink system uh, with eight inks, give it very good vibrant prints, and above all else, very, very fast. It has three monochrome tanks, so there's a, a black, a gray, and a, and a photo black, um, and this allows you quite a lot of variety. Um, the Pro 10, uh, 10 ink system, so there's now a wider uh, a gamut available there. It uses pigments, much higher color ac accuracy, subsequently a lot more longevity out of the, um, out of the prints, but this also now works with the, the Pro software. So just to give you an idea in terms of uh, a sort of an, uh, a placement as to where the printers will go, if you want lots of good vibrant colors, lots of really good uh, punchy images, that's where the Pro 100 shines. Um, the baby does give you some amazing color prints. Um, it doesn't do uh, just color. Grayscale is most certainly very, very, very good on this with very good smooth gradations uh, and very, very little graininess in, in highlights. Um, this is something that sometimes you will see that um, there, sometimes there has to be ink in, in areas of the paper that are still white and it can look grainy, but um, this one delivers a very, 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 very good result. Um, there is good re reproduction in dark areas, despite the fact that, you know, obviously shadows don't often, ca you know, carry a lot of good color uh, but this can do really good stuff the pro 10s with a pigment ink now not only does that it does more um, because it's now got a chroma optimizer um, one of the ink tanks is actually um, a, a, almost a clear fluid which basically puts a layer across the top of of the paper itself so the traditional printer would put the dots of ink where possible, we try to keep our ink droplets the same size, same shape, same everything. But light can reflect off of them in slightly different ways. With the Chroma Optimizer as the final layer, once the ink has been laid down on the paper, we put the Chroma Optimizer on top of that. It means even reflection across the entire surfaces. And as you can see, less graininess, really good glossy type of finishes. Um, the black density is astonishing. 
but for grayscale, the black density is amazing. Um, and you don't get what we call bronzing or metamerism, which is where sometimes if you tilt uh, a print under certain lighting, the black will actually start shimmering and looks, looks almost metallic. But um, the Pro 10S for, for doing grayscale, and especially when you've got something like this, is your black and white image, but everything in that is chrome and shiny. Oh my word, this printer just delivers exquisite, exquisite results there. And gallery quantity is most certainly there from the Pro 10. Enhanced black, superb gradation, longevity, longevity up to 200 years if you've stored it well, uh, accurate monochrome. The, the, the detail, the gradations in, in skin tones sh from shadows to highlights, absolutely, absolutely exquisite. exquisite. And, and a, a good smooth gradation uh, in, in all the different tones from the deepest blacks to, to the, the absolute highlights. Big difference, uh, essentially, um, on the same paper, same size print, etc. The the Pro 100 delivers a print in about 90 minutes, 90 seconds, minutes and a half. The Pro 10 will be substantially longer. Um, if you do monochromatic, obviously it's a little bit shorter uh, on the uh, sorry, a little bit longer on the Pro 100, but still substantially faster than the Pro 10. Um, connectivity, all of them have got wire, wireless built in. Um, these two have also got uh, wireless LAN, so you can set up on a network. Um, they all come standard with cloud and mobile, being able to print from the cloud, from your mobile, delivering, um, when we say shoot to print, that means you know, printing directly from the raw file on the camera if you so desire, and software as far as pro software is concerned, I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So um, the software, what's critical about this, Print Studio Pro comes standard with the printers, links seamlessly with PowerShot, uh, PowerShot Photoshop and Lightroom. Uh, as far as paper is concerned, uh, all of the Canon papers are there, but we also provide support for the two biggest ones, Canson and Heine Mueller as well, from the third party, th third party brands. Um, the, do the software, as I say, please understand, DPP is our preferred software. When you're shooting in 14-bit RAW, you bring it into DPP, start working in a 16-bit uh, environment with the RAW files uh, in DPP, and you export uh, in a 16-bit color space to, to the printers that can actually make the maximum benefit of it. The link between D Digital Photo Professional and Print Studio, Studio Pro is seamless. It's, it's a plug-in for DPP. This works with everything from um, Photoshop Express to Photoshop to Lightroom, etc. There may well be uh, issues with other softwares like Capture One, etc. But for DPP, it is seamless. Um, the, the amount of control you have is absolutely huge. So if you've worked in digital photo professional, you've kept it in the 16-bit raw format. You can print straight from that 16-bit raw. You do not have to go to DNG. You do not have to go to TIFF. You do not have to go to uh, an external application. All of your settings are right here in the software. It's quite straightforward. First things first, you would set up your printer, the type of paper, the printer size, uh, and the print quality. You then set up a layout in terms of borders and alignment and margins, and then add text. First things first, dear photographers, please do not put watermarks on your image. If you put watermarks on your image, fantastic for website use, but do not print with watermarks on your image. If you have a logo, if you have a brand, by all means, put it within the white border of the print. But superimposing it over the print for me is just heartbreaking. Okay, uh, from here you can also crop, zoom, and rotate to scale, scale within the page itself. Um, then you've got your color management op options in terms of your color mode, using the profile, using the printer profile, and your rendering intent. Again, as you get more advanced, you can start playing with color matching if you so desire, but leaving it as its default and only changing the rendering intent is what I would recommend. Uh, you can also do some correction afterwards if you're finding a blue cast or a yellow cast. And you can also do a print pattern where based on a set of parameters, you can do a test print like we used to do back in the film days um, with different color separations between each one of these. And you basically set the parameters there. It is costly because you are using extra ink, extra paper, but it means you can get a perfect color balance print if you're a bit iffy about your monitor and if a bit iffy about the lab, uh, calibration. So Quinton's telling me I've got five minutes left, but I'll talk quickly. Um, the last big, big, is that no minutes left? Two minutes, good grief. 
Jeez. So the big baby, uh, the Prograph uh, 1000, this is the monster. If you need to do A2, this is the way to go. Um, this becomes a lot more serious. It re requires a fair amount of real estate as far as your office is concerned because it does take uh, a huge amount of space, not only in the footprint of the printer, but also the space required in front of and behind it for uh, the paper path. Uh, it is an award-winning printer. It's won TIPA, ISA, and IF Designs Design Awards um, for a specific reason. It really is the high-end kind of stuff. Um, one of the best things is it has in terms of ink switching. If you do need different media, fine art media has a tendency to have a different black need to photo paper. Um, you do not have to switch ink on the printer itself. It does that itself. Um, this printer has got around about 18,000 nozzles as a, as a indication our nearest competitors only use about 2,000 nozzles and you have to purge your nozzles when you're changing from fine art paper to standard photo paper and it becomes something that can be quite expensive because the amount of ink that's chucked out um, is kind of huge and people like Toby from Photospeed it's the biggest reason why you would choose Canon. That seamless workflow is there, not only that Print Studio Pro, but you also get uh, accounting software built into this. What that allows you to do is input the price of each ink tank, input the price of the paper, and uh, it will tell you exactly right up front what the, the cost per print is going to be before you go to print with a reasonable degree of accuracy. You can run two versions of the software, one in the background with your costs, one in the foreground with your markup price so if you're sitting in front of a customer you open the markup software price uh which you've entered 100 rand for the ink tank your markup software shows 150 bucks and your client goes oh how much is it going to cost me to make this print and you run off the markup software and say oh it's 450 bucks i'll give you a two for 400 they think they're getting a great deal it, you just know better um with this baby, you can do soft proofing and hard proofing. Soft proofing through the software allows you to get an idea on your computer screen what the print is going to look like. Hard proof, obviously, printing that test prints, uh, as we said before. Um, other things that you can also do with this, HDR printing and printing from dual pixel raw. This is unique to EOS 5D4 and EOS R cameras, that you have the option of shooting in dual pixel raw. Delivers 60 million pixels despite the fact that the camera is only a 30 million Im pixel image. And that can give you much more detailed color, much higher level of sharpness and detail, and a wider range of tonalities. Um, again, working in the DP RAW file, using Canon's DPP software, using uh, the Pixma Pro print. Uh, in terms of light fastness, um, the pigment inks last substantially longer than the, uh, the dye-based inks. And again, each one is uh, set on a different standard, what we call gas fast, light fast, or album preserved. Um, as you can see, the differences are quite substantial there. 60 years on, on a gas fast type of environment. Uh, light fast, pretty much the same sort of thing, but preserved in an album up to 200 years. Uh, it's quite a major thing. Uh, Chroma Optimizer, we covered that earlier. That's exactly the same on this baby. Printing uh, via Wi-Fi directly from the cameras or wire directly from the cameras is also feasible, uh, printing from RAW. Choosing any media, we've got a wide variety of papers that we make, but you can also get uh, third-party Hanemuller cancer and stuff, and all those profiles are built in as standard. Finally, keep it real. Um, the reason why you get such good live fastness, why you get such good uh, print quality is genuine inks, genuine paper. It sounds like a sales pitch, but the amount of research and development that goes into these printers from a color perspective is based on this more than absolutely anything else in the world. And the standards that we put into when we, when we produce these things, that when you buy a photo cyan in January and it's got an expiry date of December, use it before December. Print inks have got expiry dates. Please look at those things. These are important factors to remember. Pro photographers don't even realize that ink has a lifespan and it's because it's built and made to a certain standard. Remember that. If your colors start fading, if things start going different, bring your printers into our, our, our uh, service department. We'll open it, we'll check the heads, we'll be able to tell when you used somebody else's ink, when you brought it in and you change it to an official or legal uh, print cartridge, we still know. Um, we can see the purge tank, we can see everything that you've done to that printer, the entire history is built into it. And um, we can also say, oh hey, that that cyan that you're using expired three months ago. 
keep an eye on things like that make a plan to use your stuff and um last things last um the can advantage uh nobody else makes the cameras the software and the printer we are the only brand that does all three uh i'm not saying that if you were using a nikon camera and uh adobe software and an epson printer you're not going to get great prints but a canon camera canon software canon printer makes it substantially easier to get epic quality prints uh very very quickly Whoa, that was me. Did I manage to finish in time? Well, we're, we're still going. I don't know, I don't know if uh, Facebook's forgotten us, um, but that's fine. We'll, we'll keep going. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So a, a quick question from, from uh, Pete Fulmalter. Uh, oh, Pro yeah. 1000, are the nozzles embedded in the cartridge or in the printer itself? In the print head. Cool. Yeah, so um, the, 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 you, you're replacing tanks on, on the printer itself, but the nozzles are, are in the head. Uh, and as I said, the head unit is something that you would have to change depending on the volume of printing you do, uh, but it is part of the investment in a printer. Um, the cleaning system does use ink when it cleans those nozzles. Uh, make no mistake, if you set your printer aside and you don't use it for a very, very, very long time, there's a good chance those nozzles will become you know, dried up and clogged, etc. and you will use an inordinate amount of ink to actually have it cleaned. Uh, the printers have a self-cleaning system. If you use your printer once a day, once a week, uh, the amount of ink you use to clean is actually very, very, very low. If you leave it sitting for three, four, five months, especially in this country in summer, hot, dry environments, uh, you are going to do, you are going to clog those nozzles. And if there are problems, uh, you can do a nozzle check, which is a straight, plain piece of paper. Uh, you can check the nozzles and you'll be able to see uh, print head alignment, something you should do on a regular basis if you move your printer. Um, but there's the standard maintenance. It's in the manual. You know, how many of you read a manual when you bought your printer? It um, comes with a manual? I, yeah. <laughs> the second I put up a new printer in my work environment, uh, the first thing I do is a printer head calibration. The second thing I do is, is a nozzle check. Uh, and yes, it uses ink. But in the greater scheme of things, I know everything else from there on in is going to be good. So, yeah, uh, on the Pro 1000, the tanks are purely ink. The head is where the nozzles are. And the other thing is that when you, um, you know, planning your, your, your print runs, if, you, if you're printing uh, gloss black and you want to do a matte black and then go back to, uh, you know, the other, uh, it uses yeah. ink to, to sort of clear that out. So you need to, you need to plan how you're going to be doing your and, and what you're going to be printing so that you don't sort of sure. go backwards and forwards and waste the ink uh, from that point of view. Well, yeah, that, that's most certainly the case on competitive brand uh, printers. <laughs> the, this one, for example, when you put fine art media in and it uses the matte black, the matte black has its own nozzles. Okay. So you're not taking that out and, and, and switch what we call ink switching. Did you not listen to the last two slides? <laughs> I was trying to the, see this, how we were going to get to 60, uh, 60 minutes, but okay, carry yeah. on. Yeah, no, the, the, the clincher is there. Uh, some of our competitors, you have to uh, change it from matte black to photo black, and it will then use the same nozzles, and it will have to clean those nozzles to get rid of all the matte in order to then change the paper. So if you're in a situation where your client is looking, well, oh, I don't like it glossy, can you, can you do it on that, 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 that fine art material paper? Um, every other printer is gonna go and, and chuck 40, 50, 60 rounds worth of ink into the purge unit to clean those nozzles. Well, that's, um, that's what, that's what uh, the old uh, Epson uh, that I had used to do. So I suppose that's just stuck in my mind. I'm so terrified of uh, you know, chopping and changing. Um, <laughs> it's a hard thing to get well, out of my far head. Far be it for me to, to say anything about uh, competitor brands. <laughs> say nothing. Um, I'm not. I'm just, the ProGraph doesn't do that. <laughs> um, so there's, there, there aren't any other questions here. Cool. Um, yeah, but, uh, I, um, I suppose the, the only other thing, and I, I don't know how much um, detail you went into with regards to the, um, the, the accounting software. It does come on the, the, yeah. the Pro 1000, hey? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm not 100% sure about the, the Pro 10 and the Pro 100 because yeah. uh, it, it was designed for the image prograph environment. So um, as I say, it works on the image prograph 1000. And the software is, is brilliant. Uh, you select the currency you want to work in and the actual cost you paid per ink, ta ink, can ink, ink cartridge. So when you open the printer as new, you've got a full set of tanks, but you know how much it costs to, to replace them. So you'll punch that RAND value in per cyan, per magenta, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then your box of paper. So it'll give you, you'll say, you know, you then go to your paper cost and you say, I bought the A2, 
a Canon Luster 50 sheets, and this is what I've paid for it. It will then give you a cost per sheet. You then going into the software, going into the printing engine, you go through your entire process. The last thing you do before you press print, you go to your accounting software, you run the program and, and say, how much is this print going to cost? Blah, blah, blah. And it'll tell you exactly in your currency. Yeah, I mean, that's, at the end of the day, that's if you, because I, I think a lot of photographers that, that start out in, in the business don't run it as a business. Um, yeah. You know, if you're going to be printing a print and you go, well, the, the printer's charged 100 bucks for that, so maybe I should charge, a, I don't know, 80 bucks. But if you've got, if you've got a, 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 an exact cost of what that print is going to cost you and you should be putting yeah. up, you know, however, whatever the markup is, et cetera, that, sure. that will give you accurate um, costs. And I think it's extremely important to, to have that going forward. Absolutely. And, and it, it's, it's one of the things that we, we call a clearly defined path to profit. So it, it's easy for you to understand exactly how much it's costing you and, and how much you're making as, as a profit margin on these kind of things. You know, for photography, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. And you and I were discussing this yesterday. Um, you know, the, the exchange rate's going pear-shaped. We know that we have to come out of the back of this, uh, this lockdown and having to charge more for the photo shoots than, than we, we did before. Yes, the petrol price is a little bit lower, but um, anything imported into this country, whether it's ink, whether it's paper, whether it's cameras, whether it's lenses, those prices are going up. I'm, I'm sorry to say it is going to happen. Um, our president has done some amazing stuff in terms of boosting the economy and shoring up um, our environment. And it, 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 it remains to be seen how we come out of this at the end of a month, two months, stage four, stage three, stage two, whatever it is. Uh, at the end of the case, um, we might still be in a situation where our exchange rate is still bad. The last thing that happened before we locked down was the, um, the, the agency Moody's you know, telling investors not to invest in this country. Um, the greatest scheme of things, uh, what, what Cyril has done, uh, sorry, Mr. Ramaphosa has done um, for this country is um, of extreme confidence boosting for international investors. He's done everything right. And as far as African countries are concerned, South Africa is being seen as the benchmark of how to handle uh, this kind of pandemic. It's brilliant. It is so, so, so good. And hopefully that invest of con confidence comes back at the tail end of this and our, our, you know, our currency exchange, you know, exchange rate uh, you know, strengthens again. Uh, but right now we're looking at a 25% differential in the last five days between you know, the Rand dollar, the Rand euro before we went into lockdown and today. Um, that is intimidating. So going back to our original point about the, the path to profit, printing is a clearly defined path to profit. And it is something that you can add to your gamut, to add to your to arsenal for every shoot that you do. Um, not just about delivering the product, the, the product images for a catalog, but having that one highlight image for the MD's wall. Um, you know, just, you know, push that for the bride and groom you know not just having the photos in the album having that framed beautiful magnificent massive print on fine art beautiful paper uh, as part of the package and, and cost it in and and as i was saying to you the, the best advice i could ever have or hear from from pro photographers was, was from a guy called paul hoffman based in, in cape town uh, a landscape and a wedding and uh, portrait real real life kind of photographer uh, and he basically strict, 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 strict uh, discipline on this. Um, every single photo shoot that he did, he had a percentage of money that went straight into a fund. And he called it the new camera fund. And it was inviolate. It's something that you didn't touch. You know, if the gearbox broke on the car, you, you, you went into the, into the credit card or you went into overdraft. You know, if, you, if, the, if the geezer exploded, uh, you know, you, you dug into somewhere else. The new camera fund was something you did not touch. Um, as, as, a, as a brand, yes, I know it sounds like a blatant sales pitch coming from <laughs> Canon officially, but um, at the end of the day, in order for you to keep up with the comp competition, in order for you to keep ahead of the competition, you have to keep evolving, you have to keep changing. And it's not just about learning new skills, it's adding to your software. You know, you can't sit with Lightroom that's 17 years old because there's a clarity tool or an XYZ tool that everybody else is using, you're not. Um, you have to update your software. It's part of what you need to do. You have to update your print engine. You have to up update your, your cameras. You have to update your lenses. Uh, whether it adds functionality, whether it adds quality at the end of the day, those are the things you have to decide. But having that little bit of investment, having that little bit of money put aside 
for new the new camera fund I, I call it new camera fund but it's not just about cameras it's, it's about the new laptop it's about the new USB-C cable that you now need because you can't use the old you know, B point exactly. um, I, I can't stress it more um, especially now absolutely all right. and, and again, I, I get it. You, you guys are not earning, I, and it's my, my heart breaks. I, the, the last thing I want to be seen as a brand is to be uh, pushing products on you on you right now. It's uh, we know, uh, we know, we know. And again, part of the the whole thing about this investment in your channel is to say like, hey, you know, we're not just coming along to try and sell. No, listen. We 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 certainly appreciate um, you know all the the effort that uh, that Canon puts into the industry. Uh, I, you know, for me, it's a, it's a brand that I've had uh, since day one, um, and and you guys have supported me uh, through thick and thin. Every every little whim. Hold on, this is not a bit not as sharp as I wanted you. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was quite a lot of thick at one stage. There, there was, I don't know yes. whether it was me being thick or the camera being thick, but <laughs> me. something was thick. Yeah. But, but the point is that that you've always exactly. been there, and and that's something that that I appreciate, and I know that all Canon uh, photographers do appreciate. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for for your from from my from from me as well as uh, everyone else to you personally as well as uh, Canon itself. Um, my pleasure, our pleasure. Thank you. And, we, and we we're going to stick around. Uh, we're not going anywhere. No, absolutely, absolutely. So I want to say thank other you. brands. <laughs> <laughs> Easy Tiger. <laughs> yeah, sorry. My All bad. Right, let's let's wrap it up. Uh, we have to be yeah, cut now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Roger. I appreciate it. Um, I know that uh, there were a couple of comments in there uh, where people have gone. Oh, I didn't know that. That's quite interesting. Um, which is which is really good. So thanks for 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 providing some uh, some insights um, yeah. into into the color management, etc. Um, oh. And um, yeah, uh, good luck with the, the rest of the lockdown. Hopefully, it's uh, Thank it eases you. a little bit, and 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 you guys can do business, and and hopefully the exchange rate uh, comes back down to to a, a more manageable yeah. rate, so that we don't have to pay that much more for the cameras. Um, yeah, abs absolutely. And, and again, thank you for what you're you're doing. Um, th this is a, a, of enormous value. And I, I, as I say, I look at the presentations where I can, but I look more importantly at the comments, what people are saying, dude, you're onto such a good thing. Uh, and the fact that it's not brand biased, even though you know we're, we're investing in it, the whole reason behind us investing it is to try and get other people to invest in the likes of you. And you're not the only person who's doing this. I did a talk with Diabol Kirsten the other day, Outdoor Photo is doing a fantastic thing. Orms is doing you know, really, really cool online blog stuff as well um yeah we, we we need to just keep talking to to you guys on a regular basis and we're here as much as as you guys uh, one final note i have to and this, this is the only only sponsored by canon post the, the Department of Trade and Industry uh, on Monday uh, this week declared that uh, printers are now able to be sold as essential items for home office and home schooling environment. So this entire training comes along, or this presentation comes along at exactly the right the right time. You can actually buy printers. You can actually buy ink and paper right now uh, because for home office and and um, and, and for home schooling. The, these things are, are now essentially an, an essential item. So um, again, sorry, that is the only blatant sales pitch you're going to hear. Thanks very much for everything, Quentin. Stay well, mate. Cool, man. Have a good day. Cheers, Roger. Cheers, cheers. Bye.